Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for attending Challenges for Mobile Diagnostics. Mobile MRI is a case study. My name is David Simon. I'm a research fellow at the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. The Petrie Flom Center is delighted to bring you this event as part of our research project, Diagnosing in the Home, the Ethical, Legal, and Regulatory Challenges and Opportunities of Digital Home Health. Before we get to the discussion, a few housekeeping matters. We welcome audience questions for our speakers, so please submit your questions. Throughout this entire event, we will be pulling those questions to pose to the panelists. You may be asking, how do I submit questions? The best way to do it is to use the Zoom Q&A feature, which if you scroll towards the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a little button marked Q&A. Just type your question in there. I'll be checking it very frequently. You're also welcome to join the conversation or submit a question on Twitter using the hashtag uh, private MRIs. Again, that's hashtag private M as in Mike, R as in Roger, I as in Iris, S as in Sam. If you do submit a question there, Petrie Flom staff will be monitoring it and we'll pull it into the Zoom Q&A feature. Ways that you should not try to submit questions. The raise your hand feature on Zoom. We will not be checking that feature. We've also turned off the chat function so that our panelists can really focus on what's going on. So that's not going to be a venue for you to submit questions. If you're interested in this event and interested in other health policy, bioethics, biotechnology related topics, we strongly encourage you to sign up for the Petrie Flom Center newsletter to read the blog, the Bill of Health, which features some really cutting edge commentary by legal scholars. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I want to thank some of our Petri Flom staff who helped make this event possible. Laura Chong and uh, Chloe Rochelle, thank you very much. Our panelists today are Dr. Damien Fair, professor at the Institute of Child Development, Department of Pediatrics at the University of Minnesota Medical, Center, Medical School, and he's also the Redleaf Endowed Director for the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain. We also have Dr. Francis Chen, Shen, excuse me, Professor of Law, McKnight Presidential Fellow at the University of Minnesota Law School. I'd just like to say a few words to introduce uh, the topic before we get going. Technological progress is moving at a rapid clip. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic illustrates this with various entities developing vaccines at breakneck speed, but the rapid development of medical technologies is not limited to vaccines. Companies have been working to develop various diagnostic tools that can be deployed in new settings, using new technologies with new capabilities that were unimaginable or at least highly speculative only a decade or two ago. For example, the Butterfly IQ Plus is a highly mobile ultrasound device that can be used with simply an iOS or Android device like a smartphone or a tablet. Another example is the EKO, a digital stethoscope that enables physicians to make cardiac assessments that are recorded, playable, and analyzable on an iOS or Android device. And it can also be used as a single lead electrocardiogram. Both technologies make certain diagnostic tools like ultrasounds and ECGs more portable and accessible, potentially allowing diagnostic assessments outside the traditional confines of the hospital, clinic, or physician's office. Technological advances, however, also have limits and moving technology outside of the clinic poses legal, ethical, and social challenges for clin clinicians and researchers alike. For example, if testing new technology requires introducing and explaining the technology in a foreign language, how can we ensure that research participants understand both the technology and what they are agreeing to? What ethical obligations do researchers have to communicate incidental findings, that is, findings they might, uh, that might occur through their research to their research subjects? Uh, to provide, do they have an ethical obligation to provide care to their research subjects or to connect them with care? Today, we have experts who will help us understand these issues and many more using a different technology, one that historically has been much less portable than the two that I mentioned, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists, starting first with Dr. Fair. Okay. Um, get this up here. All right. Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm happy to come and give you a little perspective on, for my um, space on brain imaging in the era era of big data. I am what they call a cognitive neuroscientist, and I do a lot of imaging, trying to understand the 
the basics of brain development with non-invasive techniques like MRI. And I think that we've learned, you know, quite a bit over the last decade or so, which, as I was just noting earlier, is kind of changing the landscape about how um, we utilize MRI for both our research and for our, our clinical, various types of clinical applications. Okay, so there's two main bullets here for what I'll describe today. One is I'm going to give you a brief a brief history of cognitive neuroscience um, and functional MRI, which I'm going to use, utilize as an exemplar here for where the space is going with regard to using techniques like MRI um, to, and the reason why it, we can see the use of these technologies um, in the home and other places making it much more access, accessible um, in, the, in the near future. Um, and then I'll talk about some the idea of big data, which is a big topic now, right now, um, where we have many many subjects and studies. When what that's taught us um, about where we're going. All right. So the the actual term cognitive neuroscience is is now about fifty years old, and it was meant to describe the intersection of of the biology of the brain with concepts of con various types of concepts of, of the mind and psychology. Um, th there was a huge boost in this space, in this field, with the advent of um, PET imaging and also what I'll, just, what I'll talk about here, a functional MRI, which essentially is measuring uh, the intricate nature of how um, neurons in the brain kind of react, relate to metabolism and, and blood flow, which allows us to see, you know, uh, activity in the brain related to um, neurons without actually ever even act touching it. Now, when this first top technology first came out, and this is kind of how I started my career, there was the potential of these technologies and how it could transform our, our um, mental health and clinical practice and research was, was en enormous. In fact, I found this old paper at the time when I was just starting graduate school, um, which was talking about how fMRI could be used. And here's just a little quote. Discussions of the future of fMRI have conjured up visions of mind-reading devices used everywhere from the front door at the airport terminal to backroom corporate personnel offices. At least one neuromarketing research firm is already trying to use fMRI to probe what consumers really think about their clients' products. So the potential, you know, at least for, for early on was very high. Um, but while it, the techniques has been, continues to be valuable in characterizing activation patterns, its clinical utility has probably been re relegated to pre-surgical planning, and, and even then, it's not really widely used. Well, 1995, um, this guy by the name Brad Biswald looked at something, uh, looked at different types of activity in the brain. This was, instead of activity related to when you're actually doing something, so, you know, when I'm like pressing a, my finger or not, um, and looking at where the activity in the brain lies, he was looking at spontaneous activity when, when the brain's at rest, not doing anything at all. Um, and what he was able to find is the spontaneous brain activity, um, when you're not actually doing any task, can largely mimic the network and the structure of the brain when you're actually doing a specific task. And that was very important because it allowed for the use of these techniques from for people to be sitting in the scanner and looking at the function without them doing anything at all, even being anesthetized, sleeping, um, anything of that nature. So the, there's many fundamental properties of organization that have come out of these techniques over the years. And the thoughts around the clinical and applied revolution of what this is called functional connectivity MRI was probably even greater, maybe even rivaled though the traditional MRI at the time. But still, Still, we haven't really gotten there. Well, along the way, um, as we kind of expanded our understanding of brain organization and development using these types of techniques and research, the data sets were also increasing in sample size or the amount of data collected per subject. So, you know, now we're starting to do studies instead of traditional studies of 50 or 100 people, they're now they're rivaling thousands of people. So 1,200 people, 1,500 people, 10,000 people, a new study out of the UK called the UK Biobank of 100,000 people with MRI scans. And, but at the same time, as this started to grow, we started seeing signs of reproducibility failures where you might see something in one MRI 
that you you don't see in, in one study in one in our MRI, which you don't see in another study from a different institution. Um, lots of papers have highlighting some big data challenges and some findings that suggest that maybe how good we thought we were doing at some of these identifying some of these characteristics in the brain um, were not actually real and not really replicable. Um, so just to conclude this first part here, so as we the, the field continues to evolve as data collected on the broader populations at a very fast rate. However, the arrival of these and these very large data sets are potentially high, highlighting um, finally, some of the parameters in the context of which we, which the field, um, in which uh, was required to get more reliable kind of data from from various types of studies and in the clinical and the to use more broadly in the clinical sciences more effectively. And in the second second, I'm just going to give you an example of what I mean, um, and just talk about this idea of big data, many subjects. So this actually comes this content actually comes from this paper that we just recently published it's in press it's at nature right now because it's a really big deal for how we think about um, um, how we utilize and contextualize data from MRI um, and it's called toward reproducible brain-wide association studies and there's just a very basic question right and the, the question was you know does the reliance on on typical neuroenergy sample sizes in our research studies provide an explanation of why when we do these when we, when we do large studies relating to clinical outcomes and things like that, don't really replicate? And if so, why is that? Now, I'm not going to go through all the data, but I'm just going to show you a, a quick little example, which revolves around this idea of sampling variability, which, which it, you know, from all your very basic statistical classes, you, you, you definitely have gone over this, um, which just measures the effect size estimate, how it varies between different sample, samples from the population. And one of my colleagues says, you know, it's objectively boring, boring and rarely considered, but it's really extremely important of how we think about our findings. So here's just the example. I might take like a, I might, my, my question was, what's the relationship between height and age? You know, as, as kids grow from, from nine to 10 to 11 years old. Now I can go into a population, I can grab, this is actually real data, and I can grab a sample of 25 people, 25 kids, and I'll see there's a relationship between height and age that maybe it's a correlation of about 0.85 or something like that. But I could go back into another population or just try it again and grab another 25 kids and I might get a sample that is highly variable and where the correlation across height and age is actually zero, which could be a completely different result. And I can do this subsampling, sampling, sample 25, sampling 25, sampling 25, over and over and over again, and I'll get a distribution of that relationship. And what you'll see Again, this is actually real data from what's called the ABCD study of adolescence. Is that you see of that small sample, there's lots of variation of those samples that you can get out. This is sampling variability. We can get correlations of height versus age or that approach one, or you might even get something that actually is negative relationship is a completely wrong answer. And then I can redo that thing, I can redo that same exercise that samples of 40, 50, 100, 500, 9,000, and look at those distributions. And what you'll see. Is that, um, is that you need lots and lots of participants to be able to get the true relationship, which is approximately point of, of R.5 or so, to be able to get where the variability of what you get is, is, is much lower. And why is this important? Well, it's because if I don't do that, if I don't have a large enough sample and I sample just a small, small group of people, I can get findings from one ins research institution or one clinical research problem, that shows me one answer, and this is real data of brain imaging, that you might have a positive relationship between some type of, some cognitive ability or psychopathology, or somebody else in another institution will get something completely opposite, which is even negative. It means the sample size needs to be much larger than we ever had imagined. And they suggest that these, that, that these consortial level data for many types of questions that relate, that we are trying to utilize for clinical applications need to have thousands and thousands of thousands of people to be able to get there, nearly 2,000 people for some of the highest effects. Now, what this kind of reminds, reminds us of, actually, is, is a place that genetics was um, about between 10 and 20 years ago, where they were identifying um, that lots of findings in genetics you know, and how it relates to specific types of mental health disorders and other types of diseases, we're not really replicating either. 
And they also found the same type of same type of issue is that in order to get replicable findings, you need to have, depending on the size of the effect, you need to have thousands of participants. Yet all the studies were had had much fewer participants in them, which is probably related to some of the reliability issues that we have. And this is a quote actually from this one of these original papers just 10 years ago, which highlights how in this new era of big data and small effects, a recalibration of views about what groundbreaking findings is actually is important and necessary. So of course the genetic world didn't sit there on their hands. They came up with these, these ideas to be able to, to kind of leverage very large sample sizes to identify the relationships with, the, with the specific genes in, in various types of complex behaviors. Now we're not gonna go through all these slides, um, again, in, in part because of timing, but I'll just point out that, you know, that what, where we're at is that you, with what was required is you would do what's called these polygenic um, risk scores, where you take a bunch of findings in the genes, relate them to your outcome, and do that over thousands, tens of thousands, twenty of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, and then combine all those small effects to identify in the target population how they might be at risk for a certain problem or a certain issue or a certain mental health disorder, things like that. Well, in, in the neuroimaging world, the exact same thing is now beginning to be applied, where you can take those types of small effects or differences, um, apply them to these very, very large samples. And then once you have all those types of risks across the brain and set up your genes, you can identify really specific relationships or risk factors related to complex behaviors, like in this case, um, in this case, ADHD. But again, the point is that to, to do this correctly, you need many subjects, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people to do this. Now, <clears throat> one of the other lessons learned from this time was that, is that if you don't do this, if you don't do this right, and you're, you, you know the special sauce of kind of what needs to be required to be able to utilize some of this information in the most optimal way for certain types of, for certain types of issues, that when you're generating those big sample sizes that serve as the base of, of the research, is that they need to be maximally inclusive. So here's just an example of, of some of these polygenic risk scores in genetics and how they, most of those base samples were based on folks of European descent and the predictive accuracy of how well they work in, in folks who are not, you know, who are, who are not part of the initial base seems to work extremely well if you also have the same, same cultural and genetic background but not so well if you're, if you're from any different kind of cultural group. Highlighting that, you know, this is an important lesson that we, that to learn is that if we're, if we're gonna utilize some of these new techniques and this new understanding of how to maximize the efficacy and the applicability of fMRI and other MRI techniques, then as we start generating these large data sets, you need to be maximally inclusive of, of folks from various types of backgrounds. So, the potential for non-invasive MRI to improve our understanding of brain function and clinical outcomes of brain-based disorders is really at this stage higher than it's ever been before. But it's going to require larger samples than previously imagined to really realize that potential. Um, technologies that make MRI uh, or, or similar non-invasive neuroimaging more accessible and of broad use will undoubtedly be part of this future. And that's a bit of what Francis is going to talk about and why, why we're here, because now MRI is, is, is being made accessible even in the home using various types of mobile technologies. But while the work can put us on a more solid footing with regard to the fundamental findings in brain organization and clinical ap applications, its growth and accessibility outside of our universities and hospitals, which has been the primary target of where we collect these types of data, um, will require a keen eye to maximize representation, the types of data collected, um, um, but also an infrastructure to promote its ethical use. So I'll, I'll end there. Um, I think we're going to, well, exactly sure how we want to take questions, um, but just thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad we get to have this discussion. Here's just a, a bunch of the people involved with some of the data I just showed. Um, in the lab, and also just, of course, there's lots of funding that we that we get to conduct a lot of the work that we do. And I'll stop there and, and, and hand it over. 
Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Shen. Great. Um, Damon, if you um, stop your screen sharing, I'll share mine and um, we'll get going here. Well, um, as Damien said, it's uh, really nice to be here. Um, thanks to um, Petri Flom, to David, to Chloe, Lauren, everyone for um, having this uh, program. I'm gonna talk about um, what uh, Damien mentioned at the very end, the advent of more portable uh, brain imaging. Uh, I have uh, provocatively <laughs> titled my presentation, Brain Scans for Everyone. But I want to talk about the ethical, legal, and social implications and the equity, diversity, and inclusion challenges that accompany this move towards more inclusive and more pervasive brain scanning. And I'll take you on a little tour of work uh, that we're doing, including work um, uh, that a working group uh, is doing involving uh, Damien as well. Uh, just uh, no disclosures. I want to acknowledge funding from NIH and others, and in particular, want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, uh, Francis Lorenz, Susan Wolf, Mike Garwood, and the NIH for the uh, grant work that is fueling um, most of the presentation today. We have a grant on a highly portable and cloud-enabled neuroimaging research, confronting ethics challenges in field research with new populations. Uh, and we have an awesome um, working group, uh, all these folks here. So anything I say today, I've learned from them, um, but what I say today are my own thoughts and should not be um, ascribed to the entire group. And if you get interested in this work, we've got a really cool website, um, neuroimagingethics.org, including as bibliography, uh, and we put all of our work on there for everyone for free. All right, so I want to cover uh, three things today. The first is kind of to set the stage and talk about the developments in more mobile and portable MRI, sort of, and put the potential even for an at-home, almost concierge service MR. Uh, and then I really want to focus the bulk of my conversation around this, identifying LC and EDI challenges. Uh, there are many, and I'll talk about some of them. And then finally, just a couple words at the end toward solutions um, and invite you to be a part of that, that conversation as well. All right, well, let's start with the, the fun stuff, which is the emergence of these new technologies. Um, I think it can be summarized in three, again, provocative, but I think grain of truth um, headlines. One is brain scans for everyone including vulnerable populations. You know, the um, article that Damien referenced is a great article. And from the abstract, I was just looking over again. Um, here's what they say. Brain behavioral phenotype association stabilize and become more reproducible with sample sizes of N greater or equal to 2,000. So for anyone who knows a brain imager, here's a fun game. Find that brain imager friend and ask, what's the largest sample size of subjects in your study, your MR study? They're not going to be anywhere even in the ballpark of 2000s, which tells you um, for research purposes, you need more brain scans and of course for clinical purposes, access. So brain scans for everyone. Well, in order to get that, you aren't gonna have radiologists everywhere. You need to reduce the barriers of entry. Um, and the idea is that anyone can scan homage to a uh, great movie, uh, Ratatouille, anyone can cook, but here anyone can scan potentially, and I'll talk about this, those who may not have the requisite training. That is just because you can get behind the car and press the pedal and drive, doesn't necessarily mean you should be driving. And finally, um, in order to, to produce more brain scans, and if anyone can do it, boy, you can really take the brain scanner places it's never been before. So brain scans everywhere. Uh, these technologies on this screen, um, they come from an article that we published last year in NeuroImage um, with permission. Uh, and there, I'm not going to talk about any one particular technology. I'm not going to get into the details. I just want to uh, highlight um, that there are a suite of new technologies. These are only some of them, um, different uh, ones being developed. We'll talk a little bit, you know, and see, see some images of this. It's called a, uh, it's the Hyperfine a company, has a device. Um, Mike Garwood and colleagues, Tommy Vaughn, are developing um, a different looking device. Uh, Larry Wald has an, and company at MGH have a device. Um, there are others uh, pictured here as well. So there are many different types of devices. From a law and regulatory point of view, rather than key on any one particular piece of technology, because we don't ne know who will become market dominant or what new technologies will show up. The thought is to find the key features, the common features that define this suite and to prepare and anticipate them. Um, so let me just uh, give you some rip from the headlines um, thing. So this is not sci-fi, this is Twitter <laughs> and YouTube. Um, one of the most interesting things for this uh, conversation today is the work of Professor Sean Dioni at Brown and the Gates Foundation. Um, and this is from his uh, Twitter feed, Advanced Baby Imaging. They live uh, streamed and put on YouTube the first home-based MR. 
they have an MR in a van and these are screenshots from their video, which you can go on and watch. And this is the picture from like walking out of the house and here's the research team right there on your front lawn. And this is from what they wanna do. They event, this is the first time they ever did it. Um, and they wanna do more. They wanna do MRI house calls, right? Imagine DoorDash showing up, except instead of Chipotle coming out of the van, um, you can go in and get an MR scan. So this is really happening. It's also happening worldwide. Um, this is just one example uh, from the, the head of the Hyperfine um, a group. And just to give you a sense of how different this is, this was a tweet from on the, on the receiving end. They said, we needed to construct a whole building for our first MRI. This one fits in a cupboard. This is really different. Hospitals uh, in the US are doing this too. Portable MR uh, opens up a world of possibilities. This is for our colleagues actually here at University of Minnesota, M Health Fairview. Um, this was one in Canada. New portable MR has the potential to change the future of healthcare. And just from two weeks ago, um, there's a story of a group in Tennessee that is exploring the use of this device in an ambulance. So this stuff is really happening. Um, and there are a lot of possibilities, new ones, you know, some that we're exploring. Uh, Damien and I put in a grant. The initial one wasn't funded, but I think we'll find funding. Uh, we wanted to create a Minnesota M mobile MRI lab. Now this is, you know, the similarities, it's because for purposes of the grant, this doesn't actually exist, but we sort of labeled, uh, said, you know, what if we took Professor Dionis and sort of modified it um, and did here, and, and our thought was to address uh, inequities in access, uh, both to research and then eventually care for MR, um, and we wanted to, to do that. The big point is that to date, magnetic resonance research and a lot of other types of neuroimaging research are geographically constrained. Even our vocabulary use, you have to go to the scanner, but the, or to the, to the hospital, to the um, research facility. Tomorrow's research and clinical practice is field-based and potentially home-based. You really could go anywhere. And as David said at the outset, um, MR can be understood as one of multiple technologies that are um, moving outside the hospital and into our everyday lives. There are a lot of reasons to be excited about these technologies. For instance, um, for consumers, brain scans are in demand and at great convenience can increase access. Uh, Damien talked a little bit about that. Um, you can monitor participants in more real life environments um, and potentially for some technologies to be combined and have real life interventions, maybe more objective data. And you can scan with much greater frequency. You know, typically we say, have you ever had an MR? Not do you get your monthly MR, right? And so these things could all change and they're exciting. They're exciting, both for clinical and research purposes. But there are a lot of ethical, legal, social implications and a lot of equity and diversity and inclusion challenges. And this has been the work of our grant uh, and the work that I do um, with, with colleagues. And I wanna talk about that. Um, we had a first grant a couple of years ago um, uh, with Mike Arwood, Gil Gonzalez, MGH with, with Susan Wolf. And some of the core issues that we identified um, are the following, informed consent. Um, again, you're out there, you're, you're not in the hospital setting. Uh, privacy issues, I'm talk about those in a little bit. Um, this is really big, establishing capacity to interpret and communicate data to remote participants. You can bring the scanner to the home. You can't bring, it's so, somewhat misleading, the, you know, you're, you're typically not gonna have Professor Dioni and his entire crew there. You're gonna have maybe just the tech. Um, there's gonna be extensive reliance on machine learning and artificial intelligence. We don't have maybe time to talk about that fully today, but it's important and I wanna flag it. Um, because of that, there's a potential bias in interpretive algorithms, especially in diverse populations. If you can take this scanner and you begin scanning in populations you've never scanned in before, that's great. But because you've never scanned with those populations before, because you haven't had diverse and large sample pools, because we're only now beginning to enter the era of big data neuroscience, that neuroimaging that Damien talked about, um, what do you do in the interim? Uh, can we trust the data we current and the algorithms we currently have? Uh, return of results is a major issue because what if uh, you, you're out there, you're remote, you find this brain scan and there's something problematic, some structural abnormality. Again, you've brought the brain scanner out far away, but you haven't brought the hospital. You haven't brought your entourage of expertise. How do you handle that? Um, and of course, access to data. Uh, I'll just briefly say that if this was the traditional model, with everything pretty self-contained within a research facility or a hospital system. Um, the new model is one in which the research facility is left behind. The scanner is out scanning, the data is being sent via the cloud, algorithms are analyzing it. Radiologists might look at it, but that radiologist is not local and raises a lot of questions. Um, when you've got a more geographically dispersed and culturally diverse set of participants, you have less immediate access to medical facilities. So if here's a 
major problem in an MR scan uh, in the facilities at Harvard or MGH, University of Minnesota, the hospital's right over there. There's a pathway. <laughs> you can just get them over. But if you're hours away, what do you do? Um, I mentioned the greater reliance on AI. Uh, there are also um, movements to utilize these technologies internationally in remote and resource limited international settings. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into detail. I just want to flag that with a, a, another grant from NIH, uh, and again, with a number of colleagues, um, we put a piece out in NeuroImage last year. And I just want to highlight a couple of the sort of take home points that will be relevant for direct to consumer and home use as well. One is that um, there's a real concern around the therapeutic misconception, which if you're not familiar with that term means for someone doing just research or just wellness, um, there uh, is a misconception potential that it has clinical value or that the data derived from it can um, you know, provide a brain health assessment. But um, that's often not the case. And so there's a disconnect between what the consumer or the research participant expects or thinks they're getting and what they're actually getting. And this could be especially problematic with very powerful brain data. Um, we've got to ensure safety. I'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Um, you know, the privacy issues are pronounced as well. Um, there are structural abnormalities that could be of great interest to insurance companies, for instance. And um, uh, how do we handle uh, the flow of data? Who gets it? Who gets access to it and its interpretation? I flagged AI. Uh, and of course, this incidental findings matters uh, as well. Uh, you know, two of our take on points here with this idea that you really in developing guidance um, ought to be looking for local partnerships and sustained local engagement and creating sustainable value. Now, this is where we're thinking about local communities. When you transport those ideas to direct a consumer setting, it means you got to think a lot about um, those consumers, especially those in vulnerable populations. Um, and here are some concerns. So I, this is kind of the flip side of the promise. So one of the promises was, hey, this is awesome for consumers. Suddenly it's like, click a button on your app and order a brain scan for later in the week. What could be, what could be better? Well, here are some perils. Who's actually showing up to administer this brain scan? One of the values that, and the great promise of this technology is you don't have to go to years and years of training. If you know how to operate an iPad, and you know how to potentially position someone in this device, maybe you could acquire brain data. On one hand, that's great. On another hand, that raises concern about the standards required for those operating the equipment. Then there's communication. It's one thing to get the data. Damien, I'm sure, will tell you that that data, unless you have an expert to analyze it and then an expert to interpret it, isn't going to be, I mean, I wouldn't know what to do with it. A consumer won't know what to do with it. There's heavy reliance on this machinery of interpretation and the language of interpretation. And because we've never had to do that outside the hospital or, or, or limited research setting, we don't have like a language to use. Genetics is a good example. There's an entire field of genetic counseling. You don't understand what those 23 and P results mean. There's like an opportunity to understand. We don't have that parallel setup. Uh, something that I'm arguing we ought to have, but we don't have it yet. And then is there a plan for handling those incidental findings? Oh, great to have, for me to have a brain scan. Uh, not so great because you found some tumor that I didn't know existed. Is it problematic? Can I live with it? Do I have the money to do further follow-up? Am I now living the next three weeks or three years in fear? Um, suddenly that on-demand convenient brain scan doesn't seem so convenient. Just one other kind of set of concerns. Um, it could increase access uh, in many important ways, um, especially to remote and marginalized populations, um, but it could not. So how will the technology actually be used? Will it fulfill its potential promise? Will those go to issues I know NIH cares about? For instance, who's the workforce using this? Who are the intended consumers? Is this being um, marketed for you know, a fancy brain club? Like only the high end could get this additional technology. Um, how do we recruit and, and, uh, and retain uh, diverse populations? I can tell you, because I've looked at this, that at present there's no neuroimaging uh, no, no, no neuroimager training for field-based research because it's never been done before. <laughs> like you've never had to take your machine or never had the opportunity to take your machine into the field. Uh, and these are things that we're trying to think about and again, access. Um, so putting all this stuff uh, together, let me think about solutions uh, just for a couple minutes. One thing to say at the outset, and I, I um, should have probably said at the beginning is that none of the technologies that I've mentioned that I'm aware of is intended as a replacement for fixed traditional MR. There are a lot of reasons for that. There are a number of things 
that these technologies, which rely on lower fields and produce images of different quality, maybe sufficiently high quality, but different quality, there's some things they'll just never do. But there are also some things that they'll be able to do that fixed scanners have never done. And that takes us back to where I began. There are going to be new markets for MR. Again, this, um, these technologies, at least in my view, are less a replacement and more a supplement and a complement and an expansion of imaging. It really is imaging for potentially everyone. Potentially anyone can scan, but should they? And brain scans could be done everywhere, but will they and should they? And to me, the biggest question right now is in this space, there are, uh, because it's so new, um, there are no real standards. And my question is, will we collectively, uh, the relevant groups, these are professional organizations, researchers, clinicians, developers, regulators, patients, research participants, consumers, develop high and meaningful standards to guide this world of brain imaging? Um, there is a future in which we don't. There's a future in which brain scans run wild. Um, you intersect that with, uh, you know, business and profit uh, motives, and you have a very problematic um, world. There's also a problematic world in which inclusivity and equity are thrown to the side, um, and in particular that the development of these standards are not developed uh, along with uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a diverse set of stakeholders. You know, the work that we're doing in the grant, the work that we're doing in other grants is trying to address this. And let me just say a couple words about that in closing. Um, MR is one of a suite of new technologies that are going, uh, you know, consumer and, and digital technologies um, with Benjamin Silverman and others at McLean Hospital. Um, we've got a program at coming at Radcliffe Institute called Intimate Data ensuring equity as psychiatry embraces boundless data and AI. Um, and, and these are the sorts of things that, you know, we're, we're thinking about, I think ought to be thought about uh, issues of racial, gender, socioeconomic equity and justice and bias. Um, and in the grant that I flagged at the beginning, this is our charge. We're right in the middle. We're kind of starting to develop our first set of consensus guidance in the second of four years. And our goal, which we'll accomplish, is to generate evidence-based consensus recommendations for the ethical conduct of research using these new technologies, using them in new and diverse field settings. So I'm confident we'll um, contribute to these standards. And I, and I think that the sort of um, pessimistic futures I mentioned won't come to bear. And I think law has a role to play. So since this is um, in a law school, our event, let me close final slide about the role of law. The clinical path, I think, is straightforward. I mean, it's bumpy and be convoluted, but straightforward, right? The idea is Let's get better measures of brain behavior and brain, brain function. Let's do that in the real world. That gives us more individualized, it's intimate data, um, and it's delivered to your door. Why do we wanna do that? Improve care, improve brain health, development of novel cures for brain diseases and disorders. But this just doesn't happen without the law. On one hand, at this early stage where there's so much research needed, we need to regulate the research um, and we need to promote the research uh, and promote it in ways that um, adhere to our values. And as it moves from the research to the applied, we're now, boy, actually, we do have concierge service. We do have this uh, proliferation of brain data. We need new policies, new standards, guidelines, training, implementation, and new laws. Um, and the work that Petrie Flom Center does at these intersections, you know, is, is right at the heart of it. So um, I'll stop there and uh, stop sharing my screen. And uh, thanks to everyone for questions that I'm sure will come. Great. Thank you so much. I think I'll start off with a question that picks up on something you mentioned towards the end of your talk, which is the market for these technologies. And one question that came to mind was, are there other uses for the mobile MR technology currently being explored other than imaging the brain, for example, imaging the knee or some organ that's maybe less complex? Um, and, and how are those is there research being done and how is that research being carried out? Is it similar to the, the kinds you've been undertaking? Yeah, I can say just a brief word on that. So the answer is yes, there are. And, and um, when you, I mean, so I'm a caveat on this, you know, it's not my expertise, but I do track it a bit. In fact, I just was, was tracking a um, MR uh, imaging company that um, is promoting a technology that will allow for assessment of um, sort of body health in particular. I think a lot of things around um, uh, fat, you know, in the body and other things. Uh, so this is happening and their marketing plan, this is one example, but I think it's illustrative of ideas is that it will aid clinicians and patients in decision-making. 
And so, um, you know, without naming the, the company uh, by, uh, by name, the idea was that they, I think they even said like color coded, um, you know, easy to understand output for you to then guide your patient about what she or, or he or they should, should do. So absolutely this is happening. And, and, and MR, Damien may talk about this more broadly is used I mean, robustly on other other body parts. In fact, most of us, if we've had an MR, it's been like on the knee or you know something something like that. So yeah, that's that's happening uh, as well. Okay, uh, Jamie, I don't know if you had a comment. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that a lot of the early technologies on this front have been driven a lot of, of around the brain, you know, but it's coming to rear view, and it's not just the MR technology that is. There's a lot of heavy investments in. It's the it's the associated um, infrastructure, you know, like you know, where do the once it's collected, where do the imaging go? Like, there's these are massive in size, and there's little tiny hard drives on these machines, and they go somewhere. But then, how do you get it there? And then, is it protected? You know, because this is all protected health information. So, um, there, so there are several um, several companies, lots of investment around the services about you know storing, grabbing holding, viewing, analyzing, processing, like that service part of it is also being heavily invested in as well, and all fronts. And um, again, going on this uh, issue of market access, how do you see standard setting organizations and stakeholders coming together or working together to ensure there are parameters that everyone can agree on and follow to make sure the imaging we get is, is of good quality and will be used for the right purposes. Damon, you want to say something for, I have lots of thoughts on that, but. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'll let you start because that's the elephant oh, Okay, in the room, sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, yeah. I, I guess several things today, David, it's a great question. Um, so one thing that just has to happen is some of the research and this is starting to happen. And so, you know, a basic type of research is, how does using the low field scanner, one of the portable scanners, line up to using the traditional thick scanner? And it's a pretty straightforward set of research studies that you run and you, and these are happening across some hospitals and more, many more of these will happen. And the relevant societies, the neurologist, the radiologist will come to a conclusion about whether or not they can um, convincingly or credibly do the same things with the new technology that they could do with the old and they'll determine we can use it for this, but not for that. I think that has a, it's, you know, it takes time and it's complicated. It's not easy, but it's at least, it's regularly done with any, when any new technology shows up. I think that unique to brain imaging will be, um, it's, I mean, maybe it's involved. I don't know, let me rephrase that. One of the things that is especially important in brain imaging and probably also especially important in a few other places like genetics is that the nature of the data collected has implications that can run quite deep because, I mean, trite to say, but right, the brain is the organ that puts it all together that really defines who we are. And so scanning the brain, in my view, is different than scanning the knee and different than scanning the heart, not on the, the technical side. Uh, and for the heart, you'd have to also figure out, you know, the knee, does this new device do the same things as traditional MR does? For the brain, I think you have to think carefully about what would an influx of brain imaging data um, do, and especially do in communities and amongst populations that have never had this data uh, before, and with clinician populations that have never utilized this sort of data before. And on that front, I think the sort of standard setting is more complicated because you have more stakeholders and you have more actors, actors who, you know, who haven't maybe done this before. And that's, you know, in part what we're trying to do on the grant is this really diverse set of professions and stakeholders. And I think if I was gonna start anywhere, however, I'd start with the standards around who gets to use the technology um, and what are the, um, the requirements, uh, it, the training requirements, whether you're a graduate student or you're an undergrad, right? This, this is the technology that a psych undergrad psychology department could, could purchase or even a high school could potentially purpose. Indeed, the grant that Damien and I would like to fund is we would like to take this into uh, middle schools because um, it could be a wonderful teaching device, but we wouldn't do that as a part of the grant is to think about, okay, how would you train? What does someone have to know in order to use this technology? Both, both about how to use it, like which button to press, but much more importantly about what to do, like Damien just saying about understanding how data is processed, understanding what an image is, 
which is a statistical, statistical recreation, right, of uh, a graphical recreation of the statistical map. So there's a lot of that work that has to be done, and I, I hope that we're, you know, a part of uh, making it happen. Okay, I wanted to shift a little bit based on something you said uh, about data quality. And this came up in, in, I think, both of your talks. <clears throat> Specifically, um, the role of, of AI and machine learning in running these technologies. And you mentioned that, Dr. Shen, you mentioned that it's important to have a representative population from which to draw data because otherwise you can get data sets that don't track the characteristics in uh, the relevant populations. And this was something that happened in the, in the genetic testing uh, context. And there was a question about this in the Q&A also that related to, well, how do you uh, figure out which population maybe to test against, even if you get all the representative data? And if we start testing based on ancestry, are we moving towards or away or somewhere different from the kind of race-based medicine that, that um, at, at one time was a popular way to, um, or at least one way to, to, to figure out what treatment to use? Now that is a very complex question, <laughs> of course. You know, um, you know the 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 call to you know entirely abandon race from medical kind of research endeavors, uh, you know, started several decades ago. Um, in fact, the AMA, I believe, just last year, just um, kind of recognized uh, race as a is a not as a social and non biological construct for the first for the first time. And really, you know, the way that um, what I've been thinking, that I've been thinking about this quite a bit is, is making sure that, you know, how you use race or really what, which is oftentimes is used as a surrogate for what you really should be measuring is like some of the structural inequities that exist in our society with regard to socioeconomic status and things like that, which is likely, the combination of which is kind of being read out as a race thing, even though it's not really race, it's not really the biology. Um, that you have to be really careful about what you're, what the question, what you're actually asking, what are you trying to figure out, you know? Because if, if you're trying to figure out, um, if you're trying to figure out, con you know, concepts or answers related to the social inequities, then race is, is is a is is something you might want to look at, but if you're actually if you're trying to understand or develop develop new therapies that are based on the biology of the brain or the knee, then it's probably that's when you then you're likely going backwards. I, I think that the to what to in the, in your terms, I think in the in the that there is like a slow movement to kind of recognize what this what this actual difference is, but it's still extremely complex and there's several new um, papers and views out that are re really quite good. I should look them up and maybe put them in the chat that um, more recently I'm describing a more detailed way to think about these, this, um, these particular issues in our research and how to, you know, and how to move forward and making sure that we're, when we're developing new therapies that utilize these types of, tech, tech, these types of technologies that we're inclusive enough such that you're not biasing anything to even potentially be harmful to one group in our society versus another. If, if I could um, piggyback on that, Damien, and I realize we, we should talk about this because I think there are some really concrete questions around this issue that are just now emerging because of big data and more diverse data sets. And I'll give you one of them. I'm presuming in most of the data sets, Damien, you and your colleagues are working. In fact, I know, I think NIH requires data sharing at the end. You know, once you've done it, you put up your data set. And there's going to be, a, you know, for each participant, all sorts of information. And I, you probably include age. I don't know if you include age, the participant, in the shared data. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Yes. You do? Okay. Yes. All right. You, you can't even include birth date, but you can include the age. Age, right. Okay. Which is, I presume, because it's, um, it's thought to be relevant. You don't include hair color. Hair color, completely irrelevant, I presume. But you include age and some other things, maybe, like height, weight, like for some of the developmental stuff or other. I, you know, who knows whatever you can connect them considering. Should that data set include 
if you had it, you could add a measure of participant self-reported rates. I, do you include gender in the data set? Mostly, and in fact, most of the demographic tables, there is some ethnicity and race is actually collected. It's collected, but okay, so so and shared, yeah, yeah, and shared, and. So as that gets shared more and more, and you got these big data sets. What if someone comes along, not you, someone comes along and starts doing some of these studies that would seem to take us back and draws inferences that, you know, you and I say, you can't do that, but like the media, like, so, so it's like a really, well, I think. That is not theoretical. Question. That is happening today. You know, so like the ABC, this is just happening in the ABCD study where, where, you know, this is a big national sample of 10,000 people. And we're we've had to, had to develop groups to kind of beat back some of some of exactly what you're talking about, you know, misuse of some of the information. Right. So, so imagine that on a grand scale where you now have, you know, even more massive uh, imaging and you're doing it at home and you've got, you know, the do it. So it's I, I think these are Davis, a great question, because okay. on one hand, you want more inclusive data sets for lots of reasons, as Damien mentioned. On the other hand, you have to think carefully about what does that mean for the practice of research and then clinical uh, care and clinical use. Um, and uh, to my mind, we're in a, a moment of flux. Uh, in, in some ways, a good flux in that people are talking about it meaningfully and carefully. But um, I will say, as I think many people on this call know, there is, and this is not unique to brain science. There are other areas of science as well. But there is, boy, a, a very sordid history of brain data and race in the United States. Um, I mean, just just horrible. And um, I'm always concerned that we replicate that uh, inadvertently. There's also, uh, just on that point, uh, gender-based misuse of data as well, sure, absolutely. Uh, dating back a long time. Um, I wanted to ask a question about, this is more of a technical question, but involves kind of legal and policy questions as well, also about AI. So assume that we get a representative data set and we start running a machine learning algorithm, <clears throat> some kind of AI, and what kind of tools do we have to double check that after we've run the algorithm for a year or two, that it's still producing accurate data. Do we have to update data sets or does it, if it's using data as it comes in, um, can that potentially bias the algorithm if it's getting fed data from different kinds of people? Uh, those those kinds of, of, of questions is more of like, how do we know that it's functioning properly? What kind of tools do we need to use to make sure these mobile MRIs continue to operate accurately? Uh, that we maybe didn't need in the traditional setting. That's another. It's another really great question. Um, there, are, you, you know, usually as these models, you know, are being built, there's often kind of the user which tries to monitor success and changes and biases and things like that. But as we've seen, particularly when we start getting this movement into the commercial space, that there's all sorts of conflicts and things you have to you have to consider. You know, I, you know, one of the big pushes in today's world is related to um, Francis' comment earlier about how we share data is the, is giving access in, open, in, in an open science framework such that there have lots of eyeballs on these, you know, on these, on the data that's used to develop some of these algorithms and um, that allow people to test the veracity of them outside of the, outside of the, the proprietary user. So I think that you know, like further, um, further infrastructure to maximize the access to the information and the utilization of that is, is something that can help um, um, avoid some mis misuses and drifting of some of these models to things that are, um, that we don't want. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, the, the systems uh, can operate um, remotely because the data flies back to mission control where the uh, proprietary AI analyzes and spits out then the, um, the image that shows up on whether it's the iPad or phone or, or the remote location. Um, and I think that transparency will be important, um, but I think that transparency is gonna be in tension with IP and protection of intellectual property. 
Um, you've just invested and your investors and your company have just given you millions, hundred millions of dollars. You can't put, you can't make that open source. Um, so that's not unique to brain imaging. I mean, that, that's where brain imaging will, you know, we, we can learn lessons from other areas of law. Um, but we haven't had to confront that in brain imaging before. And just, uh, I'm, as there was asked for a chat, I'm just, there, there are many different pieces on neuroscience and race, but there's great new work by Oliver Rollins, um, putting a one link to an article and then I'll put his book um, link as well. Great, great book. Great, thanks. So we have about four minutes left and usually we like to finish about a minute or two early. So what I'd like to ask each of you to do is comment on uh, the following question or questions, which is relating to this project, um, what, what keeps you up at night when thinking about mobile brain imaging, both from you know, the positive perspective and also from the perspective of maybe having some concerns that make you worry? Well, I can go first. You know, the thing um, that keeps me up at night is the advent of snake oil, the, the salespeople um, who show up and are going to start direct advertising and running late night commercials and be on radio and um, are going to snooker people into thinking that this imaging is giving them information that it's not. I think that's, and, and taking a whole bunch of money and, and becoming rich while doing it. I, I think that's a real big problem and um, very possible. Uh, what I'm really excited about is that this is an amazing technology. It's only getting better. It's not perfect. It's not a substitute for lots of things, but it can be a real contributor to our advancing understanding and then um, addressing of significant brain health concerns and improving brain health and, uh, and improving you know, uh, mental health uh, along the way. So I, I think there's tremendous potential here, um, and I hope we avoid the perils. Yeah, I think I just have to echo, you know, that the, um, you know, by far the, the thing you worry about the most is, um, is folks trying to apply these new technologies to, to conditions and things they can't actually assist with or answer. I mean, it already happens. I mean, um, even without this widespread uh, accessibility, um, and with it, it's a it's a big fear that we gotta you know we we definitely want to be be you know ahead of the ahead of the the game here to assist with avoiding some of the the pitfalls um, of of that accessibility as well. Um, but the possibilities are really uh, you know are are really amazingly high at this stage in the game. And say like I was saying earlier, you know, MRI it, it's, it hasn't been around in the scheme of things, it hasn't been around that long. We recognize it for things that we use for, particularly in the brain, you know, stroke and, and for tumors and things like that. But, but really the space and the expand, how, it's, how the potential for it to expand into, into um, functions that don't necessarily have a structural signature is, just enormous, you know. And if you think in today's world about of, of um, understanding and characterizing really complex disorders involving all of mental health and various types of neurologic conditions, even in the even in you know in musculoskeletal conditions, and you know, it's just the the potential is extremely high. And I think that over the last you know several decades, that we're kind of finally there to have the right context and all the special sauce of the technology, the funding, the understanding of all the things you did wrong, all that's kind of coming together all at one point. So the potential of the next decade, I think will be something on this front that you, um, that we, that we certainly haven't seen in the past. There's, there's just, the potential is just way high. So that, that part is extremely, extremely exciting. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you both for really interesting presentations and a lively Q&A. And we hope that everyone has enjoyed this webcast. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.